They are deeply rooted in God's word and of his spirit. And like Paul, they will say, I know whom I have believed. Until you can come to that personalized understanding of God, you would always have to be moving head to skater. Your Christian life will be undulating. Then I to the book of Luke chapter 12, and I will begin to read from, all right, let's start living from verse 13. Now, my title, subtitle is The Parable of the Rich Fool. I mean, sometimes we don't, when we see people, we don't look at whether they are wise, we look at the quality, the quantity of money they have. But the Bible calls this the rich fool. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who have made me a judge or a divider over you. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Then he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and goods. And I will say to my soul, So thou have made much goods laid off for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for your body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat. Then the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor, nor reap, which neither have storehouse, 
nor bands, but God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? Somehow, something has happened to the Christian faith. When the normal Christian looks at the world and sees the wealth of the worldly people, their cars, their houses, it never becomes a model. If you look at throughout the writings of Jesus, the writings of Paul, the writings of Peter, he never made anyone who is rich but doesn't have a foundation in God a model. On the other hand, he wants the preachable to know that what is it about your wealth? But does it really matter? Among the 12 people Jesus made as disciples, none of them were really wealthy. And we never knew that Jesus went all his way to become friends of the wealth, wealthy because of their wealth. Because if you look at the Ten Commandments, there was a big warning. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods, neither his wife, neither his properties. Covetousness is greed. Covetousness can also have a wider interpretation to mean the idea you have this grab mentality. It doesn't mean you are rich. A poor man can be covetous. Covetous spirit never settles down. He's always comfortable, uncomfortable whenever he sees someone who has something he does not have. And the truth about it is that that makes the covetous person very restive. He's not calm. He's not rest. One great multimillionaire was asked, what does it take for a millionaire to be happy? He says, the next dollar. All the money that Bologna had, he won't spend it in his lifetime. But he wants to be listed as the richest man in the world. He wants his stocks to always go higher. He wants to buy several cars of different colors and have all kinds of mansions. And it is further problematic because many of the preachings by many Pentecostals have centered on what you acquire. People preaching and talk about how much money they have, how many houses they have. And to them, that is a status symbol. That is what success is. And if you look at it deeply, it's a mirage. Something you think you have grasped, what is in there? Is in there. If you look around yourself and if you study history, you will find out that the so called very rich people have everything that money can buy, but they don't seem to have the very thing that they need for their life. Money gives them bed and properties, but they can't sleep. 
want to give them the best food and tranquilizers, but they don't have joy. Money can buy them the best friends in the world, but they have no relationship. Money is supposed to make them very stable, but they have serial divorce. And that is why Paul warned. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, he says, well, let's, let's look at it a little further. And let's look at it from, well, let's start from verse 6, better still. He says, but godliness and contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. I mean, if you die today now, and maybe in one week time you resurrect, you can't claim your house. If I were to show that you resurrect immediately, they will burn the papers. And so the idea of possessing things has no meaning. And have not had food and raiment, let us be content. For they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. He's not saying you should not be rich. But the driven principle in which your whole life should be money, wealth, riches. And into many foolish and harmful lusts, we drown men in destruction and prediction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which why some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, man of God, flee these things and follow righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. I mean, go to America now and have several money in the bank. And then say to them that you want to buy a house. The bank will not advise you to take your money to buy a house. They will tell you to borrow. You say you have $100,000? Okay, yes. We're going to give you a loan for $600,000. And at the end of the day, the mortgage will last you about 20 or 30 years. And by the time you are paying that mortgage, you're almost times three what you loaned. Whenever you have this sense that you are owing, if you're very honest and someone like me, I'm never at rest. And that's why I don't dare it. Some psychologists tell us that one of the greatest distresses people have is on completed projects. And so the advice, don't have a big project and leave it abandoned because may going to that project and seeing it abandoned is pain. As I'm talking to you, I have several houses people are about to sell. Simply because as they look at it, they started big, but they can't make it. Because it was supposed to give them joy, but rather they're not happy. They're not glad. Someone got his blessing with a particular little business. He's doing well. Oh, let me expand my business. Let me have other headquarters. By the time he's going from place to place, he's restless. He doesn't have time for his family. He's not healthy. His blood pressure is rising. He cannot sleep. 
He has to settle his bankers. He's riding big cars that really does not belong to him. And then Jesus says, these are the things that stress you. Beware of covetousness. I'll tell you a few things about covetousness as a roundup, gradually bring this thing to roundup. First of all, covetousness ignites an envious spirit. And an envy like jealousy will dry your bones. Because you're always looking at someone else. That man has it. He has it all made up. Is that so? There's nothing like that. There is nothing like that. The moment you get so close to that person, you will soon find that he doesn't. And he has a problem. So you're always envious. You're always jealous. You're always comparing your family with another person's family. It doesn't exist. Covetousness entraps your soul. And you have a lot of things to worry about that you don't get into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Grab here, grab here, run after this, run after this, run after that. That you don't even have time for the Lord. Why did we come to the Lord? What is the essence of Christian life? What does joy and peace we have in God, how does it come? The Bible calls riches deceitful. Look, our joy is not found in our mansions. Our joy is not found in our cars. Our joy is found in the Lord. It's found in the Lord. Try it. Go keep grabbing things and see they will give you joy. Cars, wealth, they can give you some degree of satisfaction or some degree of stability, but they cannot give you the intrinsic value of joy in your soul. And I can tell you that from my own experience as a physician. Covetousness gets you entangled into worldly pursuits. How would you ever come to church? How would you ever come to midweek service? How would you ever participate in a 21-day prayer and fasting? You can't. Because you must, you must grab it. You must hit that contract. You must get that job. The Bible says in the last days, people's mind will be entangled. You know what it means to be entangled? With the affairs of this life, that that day will take them on our ways. Even to decide the clothes to wear, a covetous man has problems. He has several shades of brown, several shades of red. He has over a hundred shoes. Is that no headache? About two years ago, I traveled to the United States. And for a period of three weeks, I only used two trousers and two or three shirts. Life was so... Because nobody cares what you wear. I put on my jeans. I put on my shirt. Go where I'm going. Nobody's going to look at you. I don't need to put on bangles or ring or earrings. Comb my hair and I'm back to my house. But in some parts of the world, we spend a large chunk. That's why most people get late to their occasion. Because they put one hairstyle, it's not that. They put on one shoe, it's not that. They ask the mirror for advice. And then when the mirror is not given, they ask another person for advice. 
Then they continue to carry another mirror in their bag. Then they say, stop, stop, stop. They are going back to change. And that life puts them completely entangled. The simplicity of life, the liberty of life, they lack it. To a covetous man, there is no enough. It's never enough. Let me break the bound. Let me expand this. Let me expand that. Let me expand that. And I tell people this. It's good to see you have the biggest house in this world. Somebody told me that, oh, we have about 20 sitting rooms. I just wonder. I said, okay, it's good. Do you know what it means to maintain a 20 sitting rooms? Twenty cities to maintain them. Now it's good if God gives you money for twenty city room and you can use them. But don't desire those things. Let everything have its own utility. Let everything be purposeful. Let everything be done to meet a need or a demand. Any extra is a weight on your body. I mean, for example, now at this age, eating extra meat, if I'm eating meat at all, is almost wrong for me now. Whenever my friends see me eating meat, they say, how can you be eating meat now? You pass that stage, take fish, lean food. When they see me eating big commodity, how can you do eating power? I take it, vegetables. They say, eat like a poor man in the afternoon, in the morning. Like a poor man in the evening. Exercise and cut down your weight. You see a very heavy buffet. I said, I went to a buffet. Does he need it? Where will the food be? Where will it be stored? It doesn't run away. Wait. And that's how when you are very covetous, it puts weight on your head, your soul. Nothing is enough. The man wants to build a house to live in. He says, oh, let's, let's build three flats. He draw the plan for three flats. Three flats he can't complete. One he can't complete. And he's abandoning everything. He stays there and he's looking at everything. To a covetous man, he doesn't come to the point which many people call equanimity. That's a word you need to know. The word equanimity means that you are calm, you are cool, you are restful, regardless of the challenges around you. Equanimity is a state of mind that puts you calm, serenity. And that's why the Bible says, God giveth his beloved sleep. I was talking to some of my colleagues today. And as we are leaving the hospital, I said, do you know how I say this life? You wake up, you walk, you get sick, and you die. That's how this world is. It's not a pessimistic view, that's it. You wake up, you know what I mean? You walk, and walk, and walk, and walk, and walk. After a while, you get sick. After getting sick, what happens? You die. Something is pushing you. More houses. More that. And the thing is telling you, look, as um, the Bible says, they don't ask themselves, who will occupy all these things I'm doing? So they lack this equanimity, this peace of mind. How can you say you are a big professor? You are a big tycoon. And you can't sleep. You can't sleep. Why no 
don't solve the issue of your sleep first. Because the fact that you can't sleep, research has shown that you are not going to live long. Surely. Almost every research tells us that those who deprive themselves of peace or sleep, they won't live long. You get depressed, they get worried. And you must know, I, cannot, I, I sleep only three hours a day. I sleep two hours a day. Why are you sleeping three hours a day? Because you want to make more money. You want to build more houses. What of the ones you have? Listen, the one celebrity was talking about how much it takes him for him to clear his car. And I've asked somebody, what is the difference between that car and the car he was using before? Is his celebratory spirit. My colleague is using Mercedes Benz 222. Then I must use one 555. What does that mean? And you can't sleep. Covetous people cannot enjoy the moment because they are always restless. They are married, they are friends, somebody will carry their husband. If their husband, they are friends, somebody will take their wife. They are never restful. And they are thinking about what if, if today I just suddenly somebody just came and take my husband away. I will be wretched. A man's Heart is where what his treasure is. And what the scripture says, set your affections on things what above. As if by your worrying, you will stop the inevitable from happening. Who among you by worrying can stop things from happening? Nobody. Somebody said, worry will certainly not give you what you want but we give you what you don't want. Covetousness will not allow you to ask the real questions of life. What is life? What is life? Jesus told them, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. It doesn't consist of it. Because anything you possess and possesses you takes your life. God has created our hearts for himself alone and not for these material things of this life. And in a sense, the covetous man is very empty. Because there is something more that I cannot get. But now flip it to the man who is content. As I close this, uh, this message. The opposite of covetousness is contentment. And let's look at Paul's definition for contentment. I told you contentment is not being laid back. It's not being lazy. In Philippians 4, he defines to us in verse 12. I know how to be abased. Do you know that a proud man doesn't know how to be abased? You see people struggling and fighting each other. I know a particular man who is professor so and so and so, and he has several degrees of blessed memory now. When you don't mention all the degrees, the man won't stand. 
You must say, Professor, this, 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 MMT, MGS, MROS, MFF, MDS, before he stands up. You mentioned three, I don't mention the five. Man will sit down. They don't know how to be abased. And if you don't know how to be abased, you will not be a happy person. They didn't introduce me. That man snubbed me. The pastor did not mention my name. They have never made me an activity group. I have sung many times in this church. The pastor did not praise me. What is different between that man's song and my own song? If you don't know how to be abased in this life, life will be restless. Then he said, I know how to abound. You see, if you are content, you will know how to enjoy the moment. I always tell my friends, I don't know if my wife will agree to this, but that I do it, but I do it. People may not know. I say, don't carry your laptop with all the statistics home. You have little children at home. And you are busy with your laptop. You say, I have a deadline. I tell you, don't allow the deadline make you die before you get to the line. And so you don't enjoy the moment. You have children who are joyful, who are happy, who are glad, who want to fall upon your legs. People who want you to play football with them, who want you to dive into the bedroom and roll around. You can't do it. You must grab that contract. You must win that lottery. You must get that grant. How many grants? Seven grants. Go and sleep, go and sleep, go and sleep. And the morning you woke up again. And your children will pass that little period. And if they are women, they begin to look for affection in another man. And then you begin to have that your child has gotten pregnant for someone. I say, God, what is me? I now move to many mountains looking for deliverance. Not knowing that you gave the, boom, the girl the bait for which he was hooked. You don't enjoy the moment. And then he now said in verse 12, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. And so if you are content, you enjoy the moment. You are thankful for the Lord. I appreciate this iPhone. It's a fairly, um, I call it a fairly um, current iPhone. But every time I look at this iPhone, and last time I traveled to the States, an iPhone 13 had come, then I said, look, I need iPhone 13. And so I went to the Apple shop with my son. And then my son asked the lady who was working in the Apple shop and said, what iPhone do you use? And then he said, iPhone 12, just like your dad. He said, why, why don't you get the iPhone 13? He said, what is the difference between the iPhone 12 and iPhone 13? Maybe color, maybe volume. Well, why should I buy iPhone 13? iPhone 12 is pretty my need. I went to Dubai for a conference, and I met some of my colleagues who were using iPhone 7. I don't know if it's iPhone 7 or iPhone 5 then. And then iPhone has already gone very far by then. So I met my colleagues, ah, you, just, you are a distinguished professor, you are you're well known all of that. I said, why not upgrade your phone? He said, this phone does everything I want. Why do I have to upgrade it? People upgrade their shoe. Some people even upgrade their eyelashes. <laughs> they don't enjoy the moment. And for those of you in Nigeria, I, I was talking to my wife yesterday that I want to go back to eating something I ate in my childhood. There's one thing we call Gary, for those of you who don't know, go online. Taking, initially when I was young, I take that Gary with ordinary water, with granite. Then later, as I started growing up, I started taking it with cold water. Then add milk. Every 
a bar or whatever you take, we end up as carrying your body. So, contentment means enjoy the moment. Time for sleep, go and sleep. Many families don't have family devotions. No, no family devotions. Contentment means you will be thankful. You'll be grateful for what God has given you. People call it gratitude. Many research, Harvard scholars, psychologists have found out that they may be may saying thank you to God every morning can make you healthy. Who are the people you love more in the world? Those are people who are thankful, who are grateful. All over you find in the Bible, give thanks always, give thanks always, give thanks always. Jesus Christ would always give thanks to God, always thankful to God. And one way of killing covetousness is by the power to give out. You see, when God blesses you with anything and you share it, look, do you know the, one of the things I fear most when I get back to heaven? It's for me to see the face of any of my relations who told me, brother, you have three cars. We don't have any. We don't eat in the evening. And you have so much money in the bank. I've always felt that, look, God made me to have for someone who doesn't have. I must not possess things that say, I worked for it. I labored for it. It's my own. No. The act of giving away, I always say that I like to be scandalously generous. The act of giving away makes a world of difference. About two days ago, we just finished a prayer meeting here with one of our brothers gave me an envelope. Paul asked him, this envelope, is there a letter in it? Because it was so flat. Like I told him I have a way of categorizing envelope. It was so flat. And then he said, no. Then he said, open it. I said, now let's open the envelope. We opened it, and I found that there were a lot of recharge cards. I thanked him for it. I felt that was very thoughtful. But before I went up and came down, I distributed the recharge card, there were about four or five of them, to everybody I met. And I saw the joy in their heart. Not only were they so joyful, one person, and two of them, not everyone, two of them sent me a test that day. Sir, thank you for that recharge card you gave. How would I say, oh, this is given to me that my recharge card might not finish. You know, who have you made happy? You know, just taking somebody from your home and giving that person five, two, don't even five thousand, two thousand a month may score you joy in heaven. I wouldn't, you, you, you won't miss anything. I always want to, anytime I see someone, I pray and I ask for the grace to find something to give. Because it breaks a hold of it belongs to me. It doesn't belong to me. I'm a steward and a caretaker of God's provisions. I have no illusion that even in this church, people give me gifts. They are not giving me gifts because I'm a rabble. They are giving me because I'm a shepherd, I'm a pastor. And by inference, they are giving me gifts for distribution. And so there's no joy. In fact, I was, I was reading something about nine, nine things. Someone wrote about nine things that you should never say aloud. And this was from somewhere in the U.S. or Britain. 
He said, don't tell people around and boast about the wealth you have. Because there are people you, that are listening to you that can't even afford it. I said, I have 20 cars. If I say I have 20 cars, maybe in a church, half of the people cannot buy a car. I have, I'm just I'm building another house in a place some people are still squatting. He said, no. No. He said, don't do that. But I said, the real distinguished people in the world, they don't brag about their wealth. They don't brag about their houses. Rather, they brag if I, they don't, if I, they, he will say, they don't even brag about who you help. He said, whenever you help anybody, don't say it. I, I, it was very touchy because it was a non-Christian document. He said, whenever you tell people and make people know that you are giving them something, you demean them. He said, just give it and forget it. Don't make reference to it. Just forget it. And for we Christians, let heaven record it. I've been in a situation before in which I helped someone do certain things, bless the person severally, and the person acknowledged everybody and never acknowledged me. And I said, that is so good for you because it keeps you humble. It keeps you humble. And then those who are content, they know that they are recipients of grace. Look, well, if you are, if you are, if you are a nurse, you are, a, you are a nursing student or a medical student, or you are a doctor, whenever you go to the hospital and you see people admitted, and it's these same people you saw a few days ago, hale and hearty, something touches you. I say, here goes I, if not the grace of God. A colleague of mine, some time, a friend of mine, the, doc, the, the lady was attending the church, the doctor in the UK now, and that's a brother who I became very close to and he became my very good friend came for a procedure in one hospital somewhere, and during the procedure, he became paralyzed. Feet down. The procedures were in done. About attempting the procedure, the boy became paralyzed. Handsome, intelligent, elegant boy. I had a doctor, I had a manager of a bank who really, I really loved because I always go to the bank. And one day she just met me and said, Pastor, I'm going for a procedure somewhere. I said, well, when you call, we'll pray for you. In five minutes, she was dead. They had not even started the procedure. Something went wrong. And she died completely. One of our distinguished academicians was going from one place to the other. I don't go to details. She so was about to cross the road. His car was hit. And he became quadriplegic. Professor, I think he was a top professor. And for 26 years before he died, the wife began to manage a quadriplegic. Some people don't know quadriplegic, someone who has no hands, I mean, whose hands and legs are paralyzed. I know you grumble about your husbands and your wives. Johnny, so a lost trust woman, great woman. J.O. and I, read her books. Pretty lady, great Christian. Was having her bath in the swimming pool. Before you know, she was hit in the cord. And for the rest of her life, she was choripedic. And do you know what? 
she started painting with, with the paint board in her mouth. The man who was to marry her left. And so what makes you think you deserve anything? What makes you and I think we are entitled to anything? What makes you to use your circumstances to judge somebody else? What makes you to show arrogance? Let me tell you this. I can tell you this seriously from a little experience about life. When you do not recognize grace, eh, one day the circumstances for which you do not recognize will happen to you. I pray that's not going to be your portion. And then you remember, ah, ah, is it not me who will just say, what are you selling? Bread, how much? Give me 50. I've seen two people in my lifetime. And I won't talk about it one, which was a bit close to me. I'll talk about one which I didn't know for a while, who was a permanent secretary. In those days, they used to call them super permanent secretary. I've seen that man begging in the streets for money. You see, he didn't plan where. Is that so? I've seen a colleague of mine, private hospital and everything, lost the wife, not by death, by divorce, separated, sold his practice, and is begging in the street of one major city. I've seen a man who had cars and everything, Call me out and said, in Yoruba language, a rabo, a fumelowo. Ewa, a fumelowo, a fumelowo. He wasn't mad. And so humility, being self-effaced, looking at people with compassion, being tolerant of the erring, no, I was speaking and I, I was speaking somewhere yesterday when I was talking about Esther. I said, there comes a time in the life of every man when he realizes that God prepared you for such a time like this. God prepared you for such a time like this. Martin Luther King said, I saw I was muscular. I saw I was so intelligent. I was more intelligent than my, my colleague, my everybody around me. And I was black. Suddenly, just occurred to me that God endowed me with these abilities to get involved in the desegregation of, the, of America. He knew his moment. Could it be that God brought you one in a family, one in a community, see the covetous man, the center of his life is his life, but a contented man the center of his life is in God. And through God, he becomes a major distributor of love to everybody. And so he can sleep. And so he can eat. And so his house is large. You know, some of us feel so joyful that nobody visits us. Although some of us did it by... by I mean, by, by choice. My friend, who, who have you made happy today? Can we pray?
I want us to pray that the Lord will keep our soul restful. Now, our spirit humble. My Father, I thank you for the opportunity given to us to come to your presence and then to listen to your word this evening or any time zones we are hearing. Father, I pray you will give us the grace to be content and to be distributors of your many grace. I ask this in Jesus' name. Can we quietly give our thanksgiving offering as I close this meeting? We don't need to sing anything. Just quietly give your thanksgiving offering and then